words of that song right there the chorus of it <clears throat> and now I am what all the day happy, happy. well wouldn't it be wonderful if that was true <laughs> all the time yeah. some of you might not be happy today are you listening you might be happy today and not happy tomorrow you might have been happy yesterday not happy today but can I say this when you when you set your affection on things above and on Christ, you can have a happiness that is genuine and real. It might not change it, it might not change the situation, but it sure helped change you. Right. Amen. Let's Amen. sing the next song. Amen. All right. While you remain standing, turn over to page number fifty seven, page fifty seven at Calvary. Amen. Amen. as much as you want to be blessed or you can just go through life uh, pushing, pushing aside the blessings of God and go on your on your unmerry way I like to go on my merry way amen and uh, <coughs> all right well let's see here uh, about these announcements uh, uh, the girls sleepover uh, teenage girls and under on December the 11th which is a Friday from 6 o'clock they'll be here at the church and uh, sleeping over, they'll be under parental authority, and uh, they'll have a good time. And then you can pick them up sometime Saturday. I don't know what time. I'll pick them up a week later if you want to. Just let these ladies keep them for a whole week. You will bring them home. That will not happen, she said. One night, one night only. Uh, she took care of that real quick, didn't she? Huh? Okay. And then, <laughs> and then this coming Saturday, even o'clock, the uh, a ladies ornament exchange and looks like they're going to have a good crowd got a, several visitors coming this year to, to uh, be in it or be with it and so that's going to be a blessing for the ladies okay 
this coming Saturday. Other events coming up in the month of December. If you can possibly shut these, uh, set these dates aside. And as we did in uh, for the week of Thanksgiving last week, we'll do the week of Christmas. If you'll help out with delivering a meal to one of our shut-ins or two. Uh, if you'll do one, it'll be a help. And uh, so if you'll volunteer to do that, it's back there in the foyer, a sign-up list. And also, for the girls that's going to be in the, in the sleepover, they need to sign up also. Okay? Uh, all right. I think that's all the announcements. And so the choir's been here since 5 o'clock practicing. Starting next Sunday, they'll be uh, going to go through the month of December, not just have it one, one Sunday. Uh, they're going to be doing some Christmas specials throughout the month. Isn't that good? And so they've been practicing out for a good while to do that. So tonight, though, we get uh, we get uh, other Christmas, not Christmas stuff, just good stuff. Sing choir, sing, amen.
that song help you a little bit? Amen. Let's stand up once again. You haven't spoken to somebody today, speak to somebody now. to have a giveaway and the first hand I see go up it's, I, I'm going to give you there's a candy bar a mounds candy bar ain't that a blessing So, you, you, you all the time protesting, ain't you, Robbie? Even when Robbie wins, he protests. Huh? Okay, that's Robbie, somebody. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Well, tonight, we're going to receive our other's offering. Uh, <coughs> the ladies who uh, do this, who, who host this uh, ornament exchange have been... Uh, buying all the stuff out of their own pocket. So we're going to help them out that night, okay? We hope to just get, a, just get a good offering and give it to them. Say, here, this will help out toward the food you're having to buy and the things you're having to do. When it started this, it was, you know, it was small. It wasn't very expensive. But, but when you get 100 people coming, it, it, it's, it's not nickels and dimes anymore. It's, it's $5, 10 15 $20. And so we want to uh, receive tonight's offering to go toward that endeavor this weekend, okay? That'll sure help these ladies out with some of that expenses, okay? And uh, be a blessing. All right. Let's go ahead and sing another song and take tonight's other's offering. And uh, pray that it'll be, it'll be sufficient for the need. All right? Amen. Amen. Let's sing a couple of verses. He was giving all the kids a bunch of candy last week. He just gave away a candy bar. Why aren't you giving away the kids? No good. No good. I may, I may do this. I may get a box out. Not an empty box. Not just a box. Not an empty box. No, no. You don't have good. Okay, too. okay. I may get just one box out and pass the box around. <laughs> Everybody can get one good. <laughs> Sam wants to be the first one to get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if it goes around, gets to him first. He won't take out <laughs> one. Okay. All right, so I, I may I may break down and be Christ-like and share some of my goober goods. One, one box. He's got a hundred. He's gonna share one. It's supposed to be a tie. I'm tied it all right. Okay. All right. Let's all stand. Turn to page number forty-two. We'll sing the first and last saved by the blood. Page number forty-two. Now ransom from sin and 
the new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved, glory, I'm saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Well, that's the only way you can be saved. It's by the blood of the crucified one. That's Jesus. Life-changing Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father, now bless the offering. I pray, dear Father, that as we receive it, we all give what you tell us to give. Lord, it'll be sufficient for the need that these ladies have this coming weekend for their get-together. I pray, God, you'd bless that meeting and, and, Lord, use it to encourage the ladies who come and even the little girls and teenagers, God, that it would be a time Lord, that you can help them and, and uh, meet a need in their life. So, Lord, help us to meet this need tonight. In thy name I pray. Amen. Miss Betty's daughter is going to come and uh, sing for us. We were supposed to sing a couple weeks ago, but Rick didn't wake her up. She slept through the whole afternoon. So Mary Ellen's here, and she's going to sing for us. she got to sing two instead of one make up a long song. you got one? Does it count as a combo? It's a combo. There you go. Amen. <laughs> we'll be praying for you. Bring the mic. Okay. I got it. They got way over here.
do you realize that we're live streaming? 50,000 people getting here, you see? Around the world.
that singing voice from a mama or a daddy, but it sure was good, amen? And uh, her mama, somebody said, I don't know. It doesn't really matter what she gets it from, she just got it, amen? All right, let me get this in my pocket. And we'll got some fresh batteries in it tonight. Dylan come up to me, he said, Preacher, I'm sorry. I said, I know it. <laughs> Oh boy, I uh, let me get this turned around here and get this out. Got it upside down. Can't find a microphone. Can't find my sermon. We in a mess, aren't we? Praise the Lord. All right, here we go. Okay, get your Bibles out and turn to the book of First Corinthians, chapter fifteen. First Corinthians, chapter fifteen. And uh, as you turn there. I got a little something I want to read to you here, okay? This little book that Bonnie gave me a few years ago. Got some humorous stuff in it. It says, An old country preacher was fishing one afternoon when he noticed a frog sitting next to him. The frog said, Mister, I've had a spell cast on me. If you'll kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And I'll make you happy for the rest of your life. The old preacher smiled, picked up the frog, and put him in his pocket. After a while, he looked into his pocket to see how the frog was doing. The frog said, Mister, I've had a spell cast on me. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And I'll make you happy for the rest of your life. The preacher just smiled and kept on fishing. When he checked on the frog again, the frog said, What's wrong with you, fella? I said I've been bewitched. Just kiss me and I'll turn back into a beautiful princess. Make you the happiest man on earth for the rest of your life. The old preacher just smiled and said, Frog, I'm sorry to tell you, but at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog than a beautiful princess. <laughs> okay. That's pretty good, amen. All right. The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. I'm going to begin reading in verse, uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse number uh, 54. But my main verse will be verse 58. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want you to look at. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always what? Abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Tonight I want to preach on these two words, always abounding, always abounding. And uh, you see, God desires for us to be, to be more and to have more. God looks at you and looks at us, and looks at I and, and us together, and he sees you individually, and he wants to do more for you. He wants to give you more. He wants you to have more. Now, when we hear that statement, uh, we sometimes, we have, we, uh, dollar signs go through our mind or uh, things go through our mind. Well, I like to have more of this and more of that. That's not necessarily what he's talking about here, nor am I talking about that. And uh, now God does give us things. He wants you to have the abundant life. He's, the Bible says he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Are you living the abundant life right now? And you should preach right now. I'm going, I, I'm going through a, a mess right now in my life. It's not very abundant. Well, maybe tonight's message can help you a little bit about that, okay? You see, ours is not to be the average lifestyle. Somebody says, well, he's just an average old Joe or whatever it may be. No. God does not desire for us to live an average lifestyle. Ours is to be a, an abundant lifestyle. 
It doesn't matter if it's a 10-year-old little boy and girl or a teenager or a mom and dad or a grandparent. God does not, God does not want you and I just to be average. He wants us to be abounding in what we do and how we live. We do not have an average God. How about that? Do we have an average God? No. Matter of fact, He's the only God. There's no God beside Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we could go on about that. How's, how is our God different than all the other gods? And there's a big difference. We don't have an average Bible or an average book. Ours is a, an above average book. Ours is a book of all books. Ours is a book that cannot be matched. Ours is a book that does not change, will never change. Matter of fact, this book is settled in heaven. So we don't have an average God, we don't have an average Bible, and we don't have an average salvation. Uh, the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is a life-changing salvation. It's a salvation that can, can take any person from the depths of sin and to the portals of glory spiritually. And so uh, we don't have an average love. Ours is above average. God, God just didn't give. God gave himself. He didn't give an angel. He gave himself through his son. So there's nothing average about, about our God, about his book, about his salvation. And there's nothing average about God's place called heaven. Aren't you glad of that? We're not going to go to a place where uh, once a week the trash starts to come around and gather the garbage up. We're not going to go to a place where you'll have to have a, uh, 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 some type of uh, weapon to protect you in your own home and riding down the road. There'll be no policeman needed in heaven. How about that? You won't need a National Guard, the Army, the Navy, the Marines. Uh, there'll be no need for any protection in heaven. Because in heaven there will be no sin. There'll be no suffering. Everything that we would think of and could think of on this earth that would drag us down and defeat us will not be in God's heaven. So we're not going to an average heaven. We're going to a place that's out of this world. It is, isn't it? Amen? So God looks at us and he tells us in his, in his word here that we are, to, we are to live an abounding life. Always abounding, abounding always. Now, the word abound that's found, is found frequently in the Bible, here's what it means. Listen to it very carefully. It means to be in excess. To be for the better. To be the best. Abound means to beyond measure. It means exceedingly more. So God is saying here, I want you to be in excess. I want you to be better. I want you to be beyond measure. And I want you to be have exceedingly more. Well, if God said that, you think he lied? No. Now, I will not be able to touch everything that God wants us to have abundantly or aboundingly. It's just too many of them. We'd be here probably till midnight. Now, you don't want that, do you? Well, I hope not. Okay, if you do, I can keep you here, all right? But I don't think, I don't think I'd make it. But <laughs> So we're going to look tonight at some, at, at some verses in the Bible or passages in the Bible to where God tells us that where we ought to abound and why we ought to abound in that endeavor, okay? Now, when we go through these tonight, I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I abounding here? In this passage of Scripture, do I need this in my life? Well, in Philippians chapter 4, if you'll flip over there, just a, about four books over to the right-hand side of your Bible, the chapter number 4, Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> it says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. In other words, Paul is saying, nobody helped me out but you. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Look at verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire, I desire fruit that may what? Abound to your account. 
I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, that, in other words, this is uh, abounding in fruit bearing. God wants us to be abounding in fruit bearing. Now, we could go through a whole list of things, the fruit of the Spirit and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, and we, we, we could do that. We don't have time to do that. The fact is, uh, why does God want us to abound in fruit bearing? The fruits of the Spirit. And, of course, bearing fruit as far as seeing folks get saved. Why is that so important? That we have the right kind of Spirit. That we have the grace, the, uh, the mercy and the truth and the patience and kindness. It's mentioned there. That others may see the evidence of life, the life of God in us. Nobody will ever know that we belong to Him if we don't have the fruit of Christ in our lives. Are you abounding in the fruit of the Spirit? Are you patient? Are you kind? And on and on I could go. Fruit bearing. It's amazing how you can talk to people or be around people and you hear them talk and you watch them. And not that you're judging whether they're saved or lost. But you listen long enough and you'll be thinking, boy, that's not very Christian. I don't know, I don't know about that. And so we need to ask ourselves each day uh, 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 this matter of fruit bearing. Abounding, bearing fruit for the Lord Je or in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you cannot bear the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, can't do it. It's impossible. Well, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, he names all those things. He talks about uh, the fruit of the, uh, of the flesh and what they are, and they're complete opposites. And so for you and I to abound in this, this uh, uh, record of fruit bearing, in fruit bearing, we must have the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Hmm. I'm mighty afraid that I, along with you, spend too many of our days not filled with the Spirit. And because we're not, uh, we, don't have, we don't bear the fruits of the Spirit. We have the idea that, you know, that's just for preachers, that's just for special people. If you're saved tonight on your way to heaven, you've been born again, you're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have the fruit of it. Amen? All right. And so I want you to see that. Now, notice number two here in the, in the book of Philippians chapter 1. Another area that God wants us to abound in. In verse number 9. Verse number 9. <clears throat> I think I got that right. Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray that your love may what? Abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Mm, listen to this verse in John 13, 35. You don't have to turn there. By this, Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Here he's talking about abounding in love. Abounding in love. Now why? That others will see we are like Jesus. Boy, when you think about the love of Jesus Christ, you think about the love of God and what it, what it entails and what it encompasses, it, it, it encompasses the whole world. But God lo so loved the whole world that he gave. And yet we can't get a husband to love his wife, a wife to love her husband, parents to love their kids, kids to love. It's almost like saved people uh, uh, create the, more, the most problems you can think of. You know what's missing in most homes? Love. You know what's missing in most marriages? Love. You know what's missing in most churches? Love. You know what's missing in most preachers? Love. The kind of love uh, that, that cares about people. Abounding in love. Jesus said, you, they'll know you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. There at the Lord's Supper, the, we, we call it the Lord's Supper, they were observing the Passover, and they got to arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus said, hey, you're not to be like the, uh, the world. And he gave the example of what kind of love they need to have. 
by washing their feet. That kind of love. That Listen, that others will see we are like Jesus. If you're going to ever abound in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be seen in how you love your, uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ. A new commandment I give you, Jesus said, that you love one another. Matter of fact, he said, if you, if you say you love me and you hate your brother, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. How can you say you love you, you love a, 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 a person you can see and you hate them and you say you love a God who you can't see? He said, that don't make sense. You can't even see God, but you say you love him. You can see your brother, but you hate him. My goodness, that doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, what, what happens to somebody? What happens to that mother, that parent, when that baby's born? And they love that baby with all their heart. They want to give that baby the best life. And in 15 years, that baby is, is, is the biggest headache they've ever seen. Here's a couple who gets married at the altar. They, they claim they love each other. They give their, their vows toward each other in the church in the presence of God and witnesses. And they pledge their love for each other. And yet, it's not very long. They're ready to fuss and fight and kill each other. The love of Christ is missing. You know why? You know why churches? Are, uh, one of the reasons we have so many churches: lack of love. You want to see? You want to see? And I, and I and I thank God, and I and I give Him the glory, and I hesitate saying this, uh, but I'll say it, and I hope you understand. Hey, in all the years I've been here, uh, thirty-eight years, we've not yet had a church split nor a fight. Does that mean we've always agreed on every little thing? Doesn't mean that at all. There's been times we've had to vote and some for and some against, but it didn't, it didn't affect the harmony of the church. Nobody went out mad and sad and, 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 and odds. The point is, churches today, they splinter out because the love of Christ is missing. And so we need to abound in that love. We need to abound in, the, in the, the fruit that's desired of us, we need to abound in the love that God wants in us. You, ought, you and I ought to pray each day, God, help me to love like you love. Lord, help me today uh, to cross somebody's path that I might can be a little help to. Number three here, we find also in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> he said... I know both how to be abased and I know how to what? Abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to what? Abound and to suffer need. Abounding in contentment. God wants us to be abounding in contentment. Wow. That's the missing thing in most Christians' lives today. Learning to be content. Think about that. Why should we? Why should that be in our life? Why should that uh, go beyond the measure, be exceedingly about in contentment? That others may see that ours is a contentment in Christ. See, as long as you are content in Christ, you'll be content with everything in your life. When you're in content, when you're not satisfied, when you're, when you're not, not happy with what you have or what's going on, you know what you're saying? I'm not happy with what God's given me. Contentment. Well, I've preached on that one subject often here, on being content. You know what contentment is? Contentment is saying, I am, I am, I'm happy with what God has given me at this time. You see, being content does not mean you don't have dreams. Doesn't mean that you don't, that you don't want more. But it means that while, while you're waiting on God and trusting God, you're content with what you have in life. I'm content with this suit I got on. Okay? And the shoes I got. And the belt I got. I'm content with the car I drive. Huh? Boy, I got that truck. I, I got a truck. You had to change gears in that truck. Okay? And I thought, boy, I'm about tired of changing gears, Brother Tommy. 
Everywhere you go, and, and, and of course, if you got a cell phone, it's hard to change gears to talk to myself. I don't talk when I'm driving my truck at all. Nothing, okay? And sometimes I'll get in the other car, and I forget I'm in the car, and I'll start mashing the clutch in the car. They got a clutch. And I just get aggravated. And one day, one day, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking, well, I'm going to trade this old truck in. I'm going to get me a truck that's not a straight drive. And, and the, this is what came, and it's like the Spirit of God said, you know what? That's helping you exercise that left leg of yours. And see, I got my left knee's my weak knee. And I found out my, my knee is better because I'm changing that. Y'all think that's funny, don't you? Being content. Being content. Does that mean that, that I shouldn't uh, soar down the road, desire another vehicle? Doesn't mean that at all. But, but if that day ever comes, I said, the Lord, you know, He'll take care of that knee. Being content with what you got. Huh? And so abounding in contentment. Paul said, I've learned, I've learned to be content when I have and then content when I don't have. Wow. I remember one time I always I thought, boy, I'd, I'd love to have a pair of wingtip shoes. How many of you know what wingtip shoes are? Hi, right, okay. I always wanted a pair of wingtip shoes. Well, in my first church, there was an, an elderly couple uh, that run a little dry goods store named Edmondson's. Right on the right hand side as you went through Adams Run, headed toward Edison Beach, a little, little old building. And Edmund Smith, and they were older couple. And I was sitting there one day, and, and he, he sold shoes, and he had a pair of wingtip shoes. Oh, boy, they think look good. And I became envious. I even coveted it. <laughs> well, I looked at those things, and I said, I said, how much are these shoes? And he told me, boy, I just put them down gently. <laughs> Because they, they they were not they were not cheap, okay? These wingtips were very to me were, were expensive shoes. Try them on, preacher. I tried them on. I hit how they fit. I said, man, they fit real good. He said, Well, you can get them on credit. I said, Nah, I just I don't, I, I don't do that. I just don't get nothing. I don't, I don't do that. I put them back up there. And he said, Well, he said, uh, uh, Well, I'll save them for you. I said, Oh no, don't save them for me. I said, If you can sell them, sell them. I may never buy them. I just forgot about it. Okay. Oh, how about six? Well, some, some months went by, and it went back by there, and his wife was in there. Now she'd give up. She'd give the whole store away. It was her. I like that woman. So I go in there, and, and there's those wingtips. And she said, and I looked at him again. She said, "You like those wingtips?" I said, "Yes, ma'am. I like these wingtips." She said, "You want them?" I said, well, I, "I said, to be honest, with you, I can't afford these." She said, oh, just take them. I said, no, I can't. She said, just take them. I said, ma'am, I can't do that. I said, you, you, you run this little store. She said, preacher, <laughs> we got more money we can spend. I thought, boy, <laughs> amen, more than we can spend? Take the shoes, and I'm giving them to you. I said, where's your husband at? She said, I don't know where he's at. Take the shoes. He don't care. I took the shoes, went home, put them on, wore them on Sunday. He come walking in. He looked down. He said, where'd you get them shoes at? I said, your wife gave them to me. He said, I knew she would. <laughs> Are you listening to Brother Baker? And I wore those shoes out. Being content, that means that you are satisfied with what God has already given you and you're not out to have what everybody else may have. You see, contentment means that, that you're not longing for what others may have. You're trusting in God to give you what you need. Now, God knows your heart's desire. You see, God knew the desires of my heart. Maybe one day I'll get a pair of wingtips. And I got them. And so, being content. Abounding in contentment. Number four, it's found over in the book of Colossians. Just one book over to your right in your Bible. Colossians chapter 2, I believe it's verse number 7. Colossians 2, verse 7. It says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, watch now, abounding therein with what? Thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. 
Wow. You know, why should we uh, be thankful? And here's why. That others may see our hearts are grateful for everything that God gives us. Abounding in thanksgiving. You know, I don't, I don't dwell on this, but I, I, I look at it many times or often. Uh, especially when we when we as a church do something for a visiting preacher. I don't necessarily do it with other people, but especially with preachers. Because if I go to a church anytime, anywhere, and they're good to me in any way, if, a, if somebody in that church gives me a necktie or a pair of socks or whatever, I get their name and ask the preacher, can you give me their address? So when I get back to Waldenburg, I can sit down and write them people a note saying thank you for whatever they gave me. And the church, I want to thank them and the pastor for their kindness to me. Okay? Now, whenever we do that for some, a preacher here, you'll be surprised. Not often, but sometimes I never hear a word. They never call, never write, say, Brother Baker, thank you for what in your church. And all that. Now, we don't do that to get a thank you, do we? No, we never get a thank you. It has no big deal. But you know what? Your thankfulness and your gratitude to God for the things that he's given you is a good measure of, of your Christianity. Abounding in thanksgiving. Are you thankful for what you have and what God gives you each day? Wow. Abounding in thanksgiving. Listen, the more God gives you, the more you should be what? Thankful. And I will say this. One of the ways to get more from God is to thank God more often. You know, I don't know if it should be this way, but it could be this way. A child who is appreciative and thankful to mom and daddy for everything they do may have to get more from mom and daddy than the others. Huh? You take a child that you give to and give to and give to, and they never say nothing. Pretty soon you say, wow, they're not appreciative. You take a child who is thankful and grateful and shows it and reveals it, you're more apt to say, I'll give to them. That shouldn't be that way. But God will, God will bless you and give to you the more thankful you are to Him and the more thankful you are to people. Boy, when I go through my... Uh, each week when I go through my prayer list in the church family, I say, Lord, I want to thank you for Miss Betty playing the organ and Miss Ruth played the organ. Lord, I want to thank you for each choir member. What a blessing they are to me and how, how the choir specials uh, help the service so much. And I go through, Lord, I want to thank you for this member and that member. And, uh, for example, I don't, may not do this every month, but I try to tell the widows in our church, I'm thankful that we can help you. I'm thankful for your prayers. And, and I thank God for your presence. And, and aren't you thankful for the widows? Sure, we ought to be. And, and, and I'll tell you what too. When we, have, when we take on missionaries and we support them, and I write them a letter letting them know, you know that we're going to help them out. I used to say this. I want to I wanna, I wanna thank God for allowing us to help support you. Amen. Now they're right back. So Brother Baker, I'm thankful you're supporting us. But you see, when we when we when we take them on, they're we're helping them. We're we're extending their fields, you might say, by helping them. So abounding in Thanksgiving. It's not just the last Thursday of each November. Thanksgiving ought to be every day of our lives. Lord, thank you for the bed. That I'll sleep in tonight. Thank you for the pillow under my head. Mm. Wow. Some of you, oh, a few moments ago, you're we getting a little bit warm in here, right? You were fanning like this. Thank God you can move your wrist. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Thank God that you're able to be in church and it gets a little bit uncomfortable. That's okay. All right. Thank God for the AC. Thank God for the heat. Abounding in thanksgiving. So every day of your life, you ought to thank God. If you would, go back to 2 Corinthians. And I want you to look, if you would, in chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Another thing we should abound in. Chapter number 8. 
verse 7 and 8. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love toward us, uh, to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, now watch this, but, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. We should abound in the helping meet the needs of others. We should abound in helping meet the needs of others. That's what he means there in verse 8. For the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. How can you prove the sincerity of your love by abounding and caring for others? By abounding and looking toward others. Now, I don't need to say a whole lot about this subject because that's one of the things I, I preach on all the time is others, 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 others. May we not ever forget that abounding and helping meet the needs of others. Think about this. Now, why should we do that? That others may see that we love, uh, we love more than in word, but we love in deed. It's easy for you to say to somebody, I love you. It's another thing to say, I love you and do something about it. You can, you, you can feel pity, but when you have compassion, that's pity in action. Jesus had compassion and he did something about it. When you have pity, you say, well, I feel sorry for him. God bless you. I'll pray for you. But compassion says, I see now I see, I see, I, I can help. I see what you need, and I can help toward that need. You may not fulfill the whole need, but you can help toward it. Others, others, others. How, how, how can you do that? So that you can, you can exemplify and give out helping others. That others may see that we're more than just speakers. We're doers of what God would do. And it's more than just taking an offering, too. It's more than just putting some money in your offer plate. That's vitally important, but it goes beyond that. It goes, you, you're going the extra mile sometimes, and you're doing it in your everyday life, where you work, where you go to school, the neighborhood you live in, your neighbors. How can you help them? Because Anne was telling me about the young men who came and cut, cut, their grass, cut her grass again. And she said, they came and went and did a good job. She said, I'm so thankful, preachers. Matter of fact, she said they left before I could tell them thank you. So she was telling me the story. She's appreciative of those who came and cut her grass. Amen. Wow, abounding in that matter. And then notice also, I'll give you a couple more, okay? And over in the book of 2 Corinthians, same in the same book, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> Look what it says here. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. You find it abound in us, aboundeth by Christ. Abounding, listen now, abounding in suffering for and with Christ. Abounding in suffering for and with Christ. Now, this is this will touch a nerve uh, in, in, our, in our lives when we think about this. You see, that others may see the patience and love of Christ manifested in us as we suffer. Suffering, suffering, nobody likes it. Nobody here would raise their hands and say, oh, preacher, I'm ready to suffer. Just let me suffer. No, that would not be the truth. But here's what we need to learn to do. That when we do suffer, that we abound, we abound in the patience and the love of Christ. Lord Jesus, what I'm going through, what I'm suffering through, does not compare with what you suffered went through. You see, when we abound in our suffering with and for Christ, it tells the world there's something different about them. Now, I made this statement two or three years ago. Didn't realize how it would impact so many people. 
It's hard for people to suffer quietly. Most people, when they suffer, they want, they want everybody to know about it. Now, I'm not saying when you're going through a suffering time that you shouldn't let folks pray for you. Matter of fact, when you're going through some physical, and you're suffering physically, going through things, I think you'll let us pray for you. But here's the point I'm trying to make. You don't have to tell everybody every little detail all the time. I learned this very first, one of the first lessons I learned in the ministry in my very first church as a young preacher fellow. There were certain people you never asked how they were doing unless you had a long time. You could ask the same person that question the very next week they'd tell you the same thing over and over again. And it wasn't that they were lying about it. They may have, they may were suffering and yet they wanted you to know about it. But it's another thing, it's a rare thing that, that uh, you can suffer and suffer quietly. By that I mean that though you're suffering, you don't complain about it, you don't gripe about it, you don't fuss about it. You say, this is a lot in my life, I accept it right now. I may, I may not like it, but Lord Jesus, listen, Lord Jesus, you suffered far more than I'll ever suffer. They scourge you. They beat you. They ripped your beard out. They beat you like a dog. And you suffered more than I'll ever suffer. So, Lord, whatever I have to suffer through, I know it's just a little taste of what you got. Huh? So, uh, abounding in the, in the sufferings for and with Christ. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. When we see what he did, for, how he suffered for us and what he went through for us as we suffer, as we go through. I'm amazed at these preachers who say, they, 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 here's what they say, that by his stripes we are healed. And they take that verse and try to make you think that if you've got some physical problems or diseases, that, that, uh, that you're not supposed to be that way. It's not God's will for you to suffer. That's not where in the Bible. If that were true, why in the why did why did why did uh, why did James die? Huh? I mean, Christians suffered by the thousands. Early days of Christianity, burned at the stake, and yet they'll say you should never suffer. By stripes you're healed. Hey, you're healed of your sin diseases. You're healed of lostness. Now, I believe in divine healing. Don't you leave her the but I believe in divine healing, but I'm going to tell you this. I believe that when you suffer, you're to suffer like the Jesus did. And he opened not his mouth. Now, if you get sick, you're going to have surgery, and, and, and I'm your preacher. I want to know about it, and I want to pray for you. You call me, and I like it when I get a phone call from somebody said, Brother Baker, I need to get the prayer chain going. Okay, what is it? Such, and they give me the details. I like that. You know what I do? I call the next one. And I say, and they then they don't call the next one. How many of you here are on, on that prayer chain? See there? Aren't you glad to hear that? Amen! And that's not complaining and griping. That's just praying. Abounding. We, well, that's one of my points that will happen. We need to abound in prayer. Last of all, how about this? First uh, Corinthians, we go back to our, our main verse. In First Corinthians, Chapter 15, verse 58. Abounding, abounding, where it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the last verse in the chapter. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always what? Abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Abounding in work for and with Christ. Abounding in work for and with Christ. You see, when you are abounding in work for Christ, He's with you. Amen? Because if He's not with you, it's not going to work out too well anyway. He must be with you. Oh my goodness. Why should we do it? Why should we do that? That others may be blessed at what He lets us do. See, we have the idea sometimes, I, I brought this message out just a few weeks ago, of what God is looking for. He's not looking for intelligence. He's not looking for uh, 
doctors of uh, degrees and all that. He's looking for anybody who will be available that he can that he'll be able to use. Now he can use an educated person. He can use one that's not so educated. He can use short people, tall people, fat people, skinny people. He can use people like me. People like you. We need to, listen. We need to listen. We need to do all to the glory of God and to the good of others. Abounding in the work for and with Christ. What are you doing for Christ? Besides coming to church. What are you doing for Christ? Besides coming to church. Are you witnessing anybody? Are you helping anybody? Are you inviting anybody to church? Are you handing out any tracts? What are you doing? Abounding. So we should do all to the glory of God and for the good of others. Now let's review. We should abound in fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. For that to happen, you got to be filled with the Spirit. We should abound in love. What kind of love? The kind of love that loves your brethren more than yourself. We must abound in contentment. Contentment. Boy, I remember many, many years ago, every time I sort of walked down that hallway out there where the water fountain is, it's just one memory. I remember the first time me and Brother George painted that floor. It's a concrete floor. And we went and bought the cheapest paint money could buy because we didn't have much money. Joe and Joe Ben remember them days. We just didn't have much money. And we went and bought some brown paint. And, and uh, we didn't know that it wasn't for concrete. <laughs> See, George and I, we just, we just knew, and we could easily paint the floor because you can't spill it on the floor. We got through, we painted that floor, we... We painted, we painted. Boy, it was enamel, which means it's slick as glass. We painted that floor, and we got down to the end down here. I said, George, look at that. He said, man, preacher, look at that. I said, how you like it? How you like it? How you like it? it?" Echoing down the hallway. (laughs) Huh? And George, he said, we ought not let anybody walk with it for at least a week. Just take pictures of it. You see, we were content. So abound in your contentment. Abound in your suffering. Abound in your works for and with Christ. Just bet. That means go, go, go. Exceedingly more. Do it more and more and more. I hope tonight you and I together as a church family would just be abounding Christians. Not necessarily getting and having more, but being more fruitful. Being better laborers for the Lord. Being patient as we suffer and wait on God. And as we suffer, we realize, boy, it's not compared to what Jesus went through. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and helping us and setting the perfect example of what we should and need to be as Christians. May our love for each other be, Lord, be sincere. May we abound in that love. May our care and look out for others be just like you. And may our patience as we suffer be like yours. And Lord, may the work we're able to do for you, may it abound in your presence. And God bless the invitation now. I pray, God, that each and every one of us would look at our own lives and see which one of these seven things we need to do more of and be a part of. It may be all of them. And so, Lord, speak to every heart now as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand our feet. Living for Jesus. A life that is true. Striving to please Him. All that I say and do. Through earth's little while. Just here a little while. Young people, kids, teenagers, abound in the fruit of the Spirit. Allow the fruit of the gospel to manifest itself in your life. It'll be a great difference. Whatever you're going through in life, 
ask God to give you patience through it, give you a smile on your face, contentment in your heart. Let your desires and want to's be in His will. Be content. Be thankful. She'll play one more verse. You'll be surprised at the people, especially young people, they're not content with what their mom and daddy may give them for Christmas. I want this, I want that, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have that. That's very selfish. Jesus don't come or you don't die, no, don't die. We'll be back here on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, okay? And if Jesus comes, we'll just shout through the sky, won't we? Amen. I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? And he could come tonight, okay? And uh, Miss Baker and I are going to go home tonight. We're going to eat some more leftovers. We ate leftovers this morning. We eat leftovers again tonight. But boy, they always good. Always good. As Bonnie fixed me a cake for my birthday. Wasn't no good. Wasn't a bit good. Only half of it's left. Half of it got to eat today. Half of a cake. German chocolate, is that right? I speak in German. It's good. It's good stuff. And, uh, but, uh, well, anyway, let's be dismissed in prayer. Father, thank you now for this good time together. Thank you for your presence in this service. May we leave here, Lord, with a, this thought in our mind. Help me to abound in what you'd have me to do, dear Lord. Keep us safe until our next appointed time together. In thy name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday, 7 o'clock.